welcome back, Hearing God's Message, Romans chapters one through three. As you know, we are attempting to hear the message of scripture in a way similar to the way the first century recipients of the letters would have heard the message. Some of the smaller, shorter letters, that's fairly easy. They would have heard the letter read. Uh, we can treat the entire letter in one video, one study. The Book of Romans is a little different. It's a much longer letter. And I can only think that the early church, the members of the church at Rome, probably spent some time analyzing and thinking about what Paul was writing, even if it were read publicly to them. Well, we come today to Romans chapters one through three. We've introduced this thought. Let's talk about the gospel. Suggested that the book of Romans might be seen as a letter of introduction uh, by Paul to the church at Rome. He had never been there. The primary theme, what is the gospel? And Paul's declaration will be that the gospel, revealing both the wrath of God and the righteousness of God, does not depend upon the law, but rather depends upon promise. His task will be to explain the nature of the gospel. What is the gospel? We've already noted in the previous video that it is a message about Jesus Christ. It is a message that has as its source God himself. It is from God. It is a message that is to be preached. It is to be proclaimed. It is God's saving plan for everyone. And so Paul was excited when he had the opportunity to preach the gospel. That was the goal of his life. He wanted to preach the good news, God's saving plan for everyone. He speaks about being eager and excited and being able to share the plan with everyone. And so the theme that we used, the title in the previous part of our study, let's talk about the gospel. And I promise to explain to you this little phrase that we encounter in chapter 1, verses uh, uh, 14 through 17, specifically verse 17, uh, the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel, beginning with faith and ending in faith, or from faith to faith, or perhaps from faithfulness to faithfulness. And I promised we would take time to explore that and to think about it. Now to understand, and we're going to cover a lot of material today, to understand where we're going and, and how we're going to do that, to begin to grasp Paul's message. Uh, again, uh, Paul's understanding of the gospel placed on him an obligation, I'm debtor, I'm obligated, but also an eagerness, a, a boldness, and unashamedness uh, declaring the righteousness of God. The gospel that is God's saving power for everyone, as I noted, uh, from faith to faith, chapter 1, verse 17, and a declaration of both God's wrath and God's righteousness. 117, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, as it is written, the righteous by faith will live from Habakkuk, and I've been reading the Old Testament. This month, I've made an effort to read the entire Old Testament to begin uh, the year 2021 recording this video in January of 2021. And as we near the end of the month, I'm happy to say that I've succeeded. Well, one of the things I noted as I was reading through that in uh, the translation I was reading, this little passage in Habakkuk chapter two and verse four actually says that um, the righteous will live by their faithfulness. And so I thought that was rather interesting as I was reading in the ESV. Uh, the gospel is a declaration of God's righteousness, and the text says, from faith to faith, or from faithfulness to faithfulness. I think it probably is saying from Christ's faithfulness to our faithfulness. We'll come to that again, but it is also a revelation of the wrath of God. Chapter 1 and verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Now, to analyze and to think about this concept of faithfulness to faithfulness, I want to contrast 117 and 321. Hope you have your Bibles. Follow along. I think it'll be more helpful if you can do that. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. 
117. Then we come to chapter 3 and verse 21, and notice what he says. He says in chapter 3 and verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, which was attested to by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, has been revealed. So twice he says the righteousness of God has been revealed. First in chapter 1, verse 17, then in chapter 3, verse 21. Well, what's in the middle? Well, what's in the middle is a declaration of the wrath of God against all forms of ungodliness. And those of you who know the book of Romans know that chapter one concludes with a, a, quite a description and right toward the end of the chapter, quite a long list uh, of those who are displeasing to God uh, with all kinds of unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, hostility, gossiping, slandering, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, contrivers of all sort of sorts of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, covenant breakers, heartless, ruthless. <laughs> That's quite a list. Um, just reading some of what we read in 1, 29 and uh, 30 and 31. And in chapter two, he's going to mention also that God's wrath comes upon uh, those who in their pridefulness fail to fulfill uh, the obligations of the Old Testament, uh, so that when we come to chapter three, uh, we conclude that all have sinned. Uh, many know these passages well, chapter three and verse nine, um, that all are under sin, both Jews and Greeks, that everyone has sinned, chapter three uh, and verse 23, no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The point is, that beginning in chapter 3 in verse 21, we have a description of this righteousness of God. This is Paul's primary point. His primary point in describing the gospel is that it is a gospel that depends upon God's righteousness. Uh, so who is righteous? Well, none are righteous. Uh, all have sinned. So what is the nature of this righteousness from God. Well, it is a righteousness, as we already noted, that was prophesied by the law and the prophets, but it does not depend on the Old Testament law. It does not depend on the Old Testament. It is a part from the law. And then there's this very interesting challenge of, of trying to understand what's being said in chapter 3 and verse 22 as he goes on from the text we read in 321, the righteousness of God that is through, and I'm reading from the NET, the righteousness of God that is through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. So as is noted in the footnote of the NET, an increasing number of scholars argue that this phrase and similar phrases throughout Paul really involve a subjective genitive, for those of you who have some understanding of the original language, and when we're talking about the faith of Christ, that's what it literally says, we're talking about Christ's faithfulness. Now, why would we say that? Well, look at the text, 322 again, the righteousness of God that is through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. If you take a, a standard translation from some older versions, it says, through faith in Christ for all who believe. Well, that's redundant. That's trite. How, why would you say it's the righteousness of God that is through faith in Christ if you have faith in Christ? Or that it's for all who believe if you believe? So this idea that the faithfulness of Christ is being described, that the righteousness of God comes to us through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ because we ourselves learn faithfulness from him. So just the challenge of reading 322 in a way that is not trite or repetitive uh, suggests to me that we're on the right track from faithfulness to faithfulness. 
Well, all of us need God's righteousness. This righteousness from God that depends on the faithfulness of Christ is based on the faithfulness of Christ and comes to those of us who are faithful. So the text says that Christ's action, his faithful action, provides a righteousness from God for those of us who faithfully follow him. Now, this righteousness is for everybody because everybody needs it. There is no one who can claim their own righteousness, even those who were attempting to live for God under the law. And then when we come to chapter 3 and continue in this paragraph, chapter 3, 21 through 24, there are three very interesting verbs, 324. As we think about how this righteousness of God comes, he says they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus because God has displayed him at his death as our propitiation or the one who provides a mercy seat accessible through faith. These three verbs we may think of as religious jargon, the idea of being justified, the idea of being redeemed, the matter of a propitiation or a sacrifice for sins, but they were very common words in the first century. They had to do with the idea of the legal system, how a person could be justified, declared righteous, or declared not guilty, had to do with the slavery system, the idea of redemption, it had to do with the religious system, uh, that is, of uh, a sacrificial system. So these were these were not religious words necessarily. They were they were very common words, and Paul uses them to say this is how God is working in our lives to accomplish for us His righteousness from faithfulness to faithfulness. That He is declaring us justified, justified freely by His grace through. Jesus Christ. It is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and through propitiation, through the mercy seat. So here's our study. What is this righteousness like? What is the nature of this righteousness that comes from God? Well, it is justification. It is redemption. It is forgiveness. God provides this righteousness. Well, why? Well, that's the subject of verses 25 and 26. It says this was to demonstrate God's righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over sins previously committed. Now, this is a, a rather complex theological matter, and we're not going to explore it fully as to exactly what happened to sins in the Old Testament, but the book of Hebrews makes clear that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. So they were remembered year after year. And sometimes we describe that as a process of rolling them forward. But verse 26 makes clear, Romans chapter three, this was to demonstrate his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and justifier of the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. Again, I'm reading NET. So here is, we depend on Jesus' faithfulness, and we live because of his faithfulness. And in that faithfulness, God is seen to be both just and justifier. So we've seen the what of this righteousness from God, and we've seen the why. Why did God provide such righteousness? So that he might be just and justifier. It is because of his justice, which is, as we've already noted, also the word righteousness. Passing over Old Testament sins, God could have appeared to be unrighteous, unjust, but now he justifies all through a righteousness that depends on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. This is not only faith in Christ, this is faithfulness that makes us like Christ because Christ was faithfulness. So, Christ
Christ's faithfulness is the model for our faithfulness, which brings us to the end of our study, the end of chapter three. We've covered a lot of territory. We've not spent a lot of time talking about God's wrath in the end of chapter one and chapter two and the beginning of chapter three, but to try to grasp the message of the book of Romans, to hear the message, and then to begin to make application, I think we've done what needed to be done. The message is not about God's wrath. That bad news is only setting up the good news. The real message is about God's righteousness and how that can be applied in your life and my life. And so we have in chapter three, verses 27 through the end of the chapter, a summary, especially focused on the Jewish attitudes that are reflected in chapter two. Now, boasting is excluded. That's what we're going to read as we come to chapter three, verse 27. Boasting is excluded on two counts. First, it's excluded uh, because uh, what matters is not observing the law. So if you're thinking you're going to boast because you're doing such a good job observing the legal system, especially the Old Testament law in the case of the Jews in chapter two, <laughs> A boasting is going to be excluded. Uh, boasting is going to be excluded, first of all, because what matters is not observing the law. And secondly, boasting is excluded because of our faithfulness, which comes directly from Christ's faithfulness. So we're not depending on our faithfulness. We're not even depending on our faith. We're depending on Christ's faithfulness. Now, this justification, remember, chapter 3, verse 21, is apart from the law and is for everyone because all have sinned. There's no difference. All are equal. So here is a justification apart from the law that demonstrates that God is God of everyone. God is the God and the Savior, the justifier, if you will, of not only those who are under the law, the Jews, but God is the justifier of everyone. The gospel is God's power for salvation to everyone who participates in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, everyone who believes. 322 is right. Beginning with Christ's faithfulness, then we accept and depend upon, that is, we believe that what Christ has done is sufficient for us. So we are justified by the faith or faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And this justification by faith extends to both Jews and Gentiles. Both are justified by the same faith of Christ. Now we come to a text that sometimes is a little bit easy, uh, depending on how you've read the context of this point. But for the majority of readers of the book of Romans, it's a difficult text. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. Indeed, we uphold the law. Well, what is the relationship between the law and faith? That's the question that, that has to be raised in this text. And we can be helped a great deal if we will think about the way that Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21 provides a commentary, if you will. Paul writes and says, I do not set aside God's grace because if righteousness could come through the law, Christ died for nothing. And the point is that righteousness can't come through the law. <laughs> Excuse me. Righteousness cannot come through the law. So if righteousness is through the law, Christ's faithfulness is meaningless. Christ died for nothing. Christ died in vain. Well, then what is the relationship? What is the purpose of the law? The law served God's purpose proclaiming the truth to which the law pointed. So Galatians 3, if we were to go on in that passage in Galatians, Galatians 3 says that the point of the gospel is not that it's anti-law, but that it is a recognition of the law's validity, purpose, and fulfillment. The law did what God gave the law to do, and that is to point to the seed, to point to Christ, to point to the descendant, the inheritor 
of Abraham. And that is an affirmation of the law and is God's purpose for the law. So this teaching, this faithfulness of Christ and our faithfulness and righteousness that comes through faithfulness does not nullify the law. It actually validates the purpose of the law. That's what Paul is saying in 331. So God's purpose for the law is fulfilled by proclaiming the truth to which the law pointed. So here's where we have been as we conclude. Romans chapter 1 through 3. I know we're covering a lot of territory, but we're trying to grasp a message, and we're not helped in grasping the message by doing this verse after verse, or even chapter after chapter. In some cases, we're going to have to cover multiple chapters. So here we are, kind of a summary of Romans 1 through 3. Paul's message is about the gospel. Salvation by the gospel is for everyone, Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel reveals the severity of God's wrath and the extent of God's righteousness. And that righteousness is through the faithfulness of Jesus and comes to all who believe. That is those who are of the faithfulness of Jesus, those who follow in his faithfulness. So that 322 is a clarification of 117, the faithfulness of Christ, and we believe and imitate that faithfulness. So the gospel is from faith to faith. It comes out of faith, and it leads to our faithfulness through the faith of Christ, declaring as righteous all who have and imitate the faith of Christ. So here are two great truths, if we want to simplify. Two great truths out of Romans chapters 1 through 3. Salvation for everyone is by the gospel, the righteousness of God. And that righteousness depends on and comes to us through the faithfulness of Jesus so that God is both just and justifier. Well, I hope you're excited about our study by this time. I cannot wait to move on and to think about how Paul is going to explain this in chapters four and five. Next time, I hope that we'll be able to study together soon. We're going to come to some passages that are just a, a little bit difficult and some people as they read and as they study. Let's pray. I'll make a final word and we'll be done. Father, thank you for the opportunity to experience the excitement of re receiving this letter that Paul wrote to Rome and to understand the saving power of the gospel and begin to unpack what, what righteousness you declare for us and you make possible for us and redeeming us and saving us and, and providing a sufficient sacrifice so that you are showing the ultimate accomplishment of all that you've been working toward uh, through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Help us to understand, help us to apply, help us to appreciate what it means that, that God is both just and justifier through the faithfulness of Christ. May that faithfulness lead to our faithfulness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, I thank you for being with me. Looking forward to being with you next time. Read ahead a little bit. Spend some time reviewing, read again, Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. Read ahead in chapter 4 and chapter 5. Looking forward to continuing to study with you, hearing the message, God's word for us, that we might live by the faith of Abraham being children of faith and inheritors of the promise. God bless. I look forward to being with you in our next study together.